This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh on Capitol Hill. The brother of George Floyd, whose killing at the hands of Minneapolis police officers has sparked a global uprising, demanded lawmakers take action to stop more deaths at the hands of police. Felonis Floyd traveled to Washington, D.C., to address the House Judiciary Committee in person, demanding they take action to stop more deaths. George always made sacrifices for our family, and he made sacrifices for complete strangers. He gave the little that he had to help others. He was our gentle giant. I was reminded of that when I watched the video of his murder. He called all the officers, sir. He was mild-mannered. He didn't fight back. He listened to all the officers. The man who took his life, who suffocated him for eight minutes and 46 seconds, he still called them sir as he begged for his life. I can't tell you the kind of pain you feel when you watch something like that. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to your whole entire life, die, die begging for his mom, I'm tired. I'm tired of pain. Pain you feel when you watch something like that. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to for your whole life, die, die begging for his mom, I'm here to ask you to make it stop. Stop the pain. Stop us from being tired. George called for help, and he was ignored. Please listen to the call I'm making to you now to the cause of our family and the cause ringing out the streets across the world. People of all backgrounds, genders and races have come together to demand change. Honor them, honor George, and make the necessary changes that make law enforcement the solution and not the problem. Hold them accountable when they do something wrong Teach them what it means to treat people with empathy and respect. Teach them what necessary force is. Teach them that deadly force should be used rarely and only when life is at risk. George wasn't hurting anyone that day. He didn't deserve to die over $20. I'm asking you, is that what a, is that what a black man is worth? $20? This is 2020. Enough is enough. The people marching in the streets are telling you enough is enough. By the leaders that in our country, the world needs the right thing. The people elected you to speak for them, to make positive change. George's name means something. You have the opportunity here today to make your names mean something too. If his death ends up changing the world for the better, and I think it will, then he died as he lived. It is on you to make sure his death is not in vain. I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to Perry while he was here. I was robbed of that. But I, but I know he's looking down at us now. Perry, look up at what you did. Big brother, you changed the world. Thank you for everything, for taking care of us when on earth, for taking care of us now. I hope you found mama and you can rest in peace with power. Thank you. That's Philonese Floyd, George Floyd's brother, George Perry Floyd, known as Perry by his loved ones. Philonese was testifying Wednesday before the House Judiciary Committee as momentum for defunding the police grows amidst nationwide protests, global protests over Floyd's killing by Minneapolis police. For more on the mass uprising engulfing the U.S. and what protesters are demanding now, we go to Los Angeles, where we're joined by Robin Kelly professor of African-American studies at UCLA. He studies social movements, author of many books, including Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. Professor Kelly, it's great to have you back with us, especially now. I mean, just in the last hours, you have the 
um, the icons of the Confederacy being tumbled throughout the United States. You have President Trump announcing he's giving his first campaign speech in months in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the site of one of the worst massacres of black people in U.S. history, um, on Juneteenth, June 19th, this in the midst of this global uprising. Talk about this moment we are in. Right. Yeah, that's a slap in the face. Um, let me begin by uh, talking about um, Philonis Floyd's testimony, because um, it was, you know, listening to it again is very emotional. I mean, it really captures the moment we're in. Uh, it, it moved me in part because we've been hearing this speech, I, I've been hearing this speech my entire life. Uh, I don't remember uh, a moment in my life when I haven't heard someone talking about holding the police accountable, teaching cops to treat people with empathy and respect, uh, teaching them, you know, appropriate force. Uh, and I was really struck again, this kind of captures the moment by how George Floyd, um, you know, called the, the officers, sir, and this is something that his brother mentioned, as he was being killed, called them, sir. Uh, and it was a painful and telling revelation, given, given how, you know, black men and women were beaten or even killed for not addressing an officer of the law or any white man as sir. You know, this, is ha this happened to my uh, to my father-in-law. So in some ways, that question and the other question, which is, what is a black man's worth? You know, $20. Um, this moment that we're in now raises that question. You have mass protests around the world. Uh, coming back to a perennial question is, what are black lives worth? Um, are black lives worth more than, uh, or less than property? I mean, Black Lives Matter drilled down on this question from the moment's inception, you know, asking the question, what kind of society is this that values property over black life? Um, and, you know, when you think about even your last guest talking about, you know, tear gassing, um, the fact that people are being tear gassed during a pandemic, you know, and over this question of whether or not uh, black life has value. You know, so this is a really crucial moment. Um, clearly, Trump and his ilk are uh, really drilling down on what I would argue is, you know, a, a fascist response. Um, it's, it's drilling down on a state that has no issue uh, taking people's lives over the smallest infraction. Uh, and I think you know, I have a lot of—I I, I shouldn't say hope, but I do have—I do imagine uh, real change occurring when you have uh, millions of people in the street saying, not what people said in 68, this is a very different moment, uh, but actually saying that we can't have police as we knew it, you know. Um, you think about the, the uprisings in the 1960s where so many of these struggles emerging out of, you know, ghetto uh, communities, uh, you know, demanding an end to police brutality, police violence, demanding an end to the denial of basic needs, services, jobs. And in those days, the demand, the response to the demands were things like diversity, inclusion, um, community oversight, more black cops, uh, demands that officers live in the community, um, you know, and you compare that to defunding the police, to basically reorganizing the way we deal with public safety. Uh, and this is coming from many different circles, people who, who thought five, six years ago uh, that was a ridiculous demand are now seeing it as not only viable, but we're seeing it happening. Um, we're seeing at least the beginnings of it happening. We'll see what, how it turns out, you know. Well, Professor Kelly, I want to go back to something that you wrote uh, immediately following uh, Trump's election in November 2016. You wrote that the U.S. needs a multiracial movement committed to, quote, dismantling the oppressive regimes of racism, heteropatriarchy, empire, and class exploitation that is at the root of inequality, precarity, materialism, 
and violence in many forms. You've just talked about how the demands of this movement are very different. Do you see what's happening now as what you wanted to happen in November 2016? Exactly. And not only that, but what I wrote in, in 2016 was actually a reflection of what was already happening on the ground. So in some respects, remember the Movement for Black Lives put out their, their policy platform in August of 2016. Uh, and one of the things I really we all have to acknowledge is that we're not here by accident. You know, this is not a spontaneous response to the pandemic and suddenly uh, white people are, are waking up and saying, oh, wait a second, Black Lives Matter. No, this is a product of enormous work uh, going back well before, you know, Trayvon Martin. But, you know, but you think about, you know, all the organizing work, the, the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, uh, the women who organize Black Lives Matter, um, initiated Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, uh, people like Melina Abdullah, Charlene Carruthers of Black Youth uh, Project 100, uh, all the scholar activists who've been working on this question, Barbara Ransby, Kimberly Crenshaw, Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, and then before that, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, uh, Cop Watch, uh, Dignity and Power, Critical Resistance, the African American Policy Forum, these were uh, uh, initiatives on the ground who did all this political education, all this organizing work, um, recharge genocide, dream defenders, the rising majority, black organizing for leadership and dignity, and, and also groups like Surge, you know, standing up for racial justice, uh, um, which deals with, you know, uh, white racism. So you have an infrastructure in place that that has been doing this work for a decade or more, more than a decade. And that's why people are out here. That's why people can come onto the streets and simply roll off their tongue words like defund the police, um, connect um, transphobia, homophobia, um, uh, uh, gender oppression, patriarchy to uh, racial capitalism and to racial violence, connect these things in ways that I think are kind of unprecedented. But again, without the organizing work, we would not be here, you know? And I think it's very important to even go back and acknowledge how the foundations were laid by the Combahee River Collective, you know, by people like Barbara Smith, um, raised by the Third World Women's Alliance. I mean, fighting around questions of c connecting sterilization, uh, abortion rights uh, with, you know, racism. You know, so these kinds of links, these connections, and also with war uh, are important. So there's a long history that, that got us here. And, and what the real question now is whether or not this can be sustained, because we know throughout history, we've had revolutionary moments after Reconstruction in the 1870s, followed by backlash and by what we could describe as American fascism. We have... Um, the, the sort of second reconstruction of the 1960s, followed by backlash, the rise of the Klan, the tamping down on the strike wave in the 1970s, um, uh, the neoliberalism. And now we're facing another one. You have these forces trying to transform the world in a way that could actually bring safety and prosperity to all versus a president and a regime that asks, you know, what happened to Gone with the Wind?